Well, I hope I'm sounding a little better. I, I wanted to try something uh, a little thicker, maybe two or three C's thick, uh, instead of something like a, a lemon lime soda, just to help uh, help keep things uh, uh, moist over here. So I have a sugar, for, uh, apparently I have a potion of invisibility. Uh, and if you want to make your own potion of invisibility, you mix some zero sugar peppermint mocha creamer with some unsweetened vanilla almond milk. And you have something with very, very, very low carbs that tastes really yummy and uh, it has a good mouth feel. Anyway, while I sip on this and hopefully... Uh, hey, Heretic Trance. Good to see you. Um, it helps my voice to uh, not not sound as strained. Uh, I wanted to go over... Um, I wanted to go over some concepts before we illustrate our region. And so I believe we can do that here with the help of some music. A satyr butterfly. Well, uh, tieflings and dragonborn can have wings. Maybe the ones of this world did too. Might make them look extra strange. So that could be a consideration of things. Remember, this is your, your fantasy world. Now, in our exercise, we left everything open for, uh, for chance. I did make a stabby crabby. I hope that you enjoy it. Uh, I primed it white, and it's ready to be painted, and I don't know, I don't know what to do with it. I gotta do something with the crab. There's probably a second one waiting for me at the store, ready to scrape off and prime up, too. I can just keep printing those things forever. So anyway, in our last segment, we had come up with elements of our region which are going to help further um, specify the conditions the people who observe and celebrate these holidays uh, experience. And so it's going to be important for us to learn a little bit more about cold deserts. Yeah, we, we were talking about satyrs, wine, and mead earlier too, Heretic. And I was correct, the Gobi Desert in Inner Mongolia uh, is a cold desert. Uh, this is the Great Basin, uh, well, this is a bristlecone pine in the, in the Great Basin National Park in Nevada. Uh, we go back to the Gobi Desert. And while it is a desert, here's a patch of vegetation, it does exist. And then there's even a polar desert. And what was the quality of a desert? Uh, we are going to be uh, we're going to be exploring that. So we have our principal regions of hot deserts and our temperate deserts. You can see that there's a uh, you know a particular uh, latitude in which these lie here. Uh, you know we have the the Gobi Desert here. Uh, then you know we're we're getting up uh, into the into the Rockies and such. Hi, Delport. Yep, exactly, uh, exactly, Delport. So if we uh, if we back out of here, uh, for any of you who want the source, this is from uh, Encyclopedia Britannica. I remember reading actual physical book copies of this. I needed them for my reports in school. And then I remembered when it was put on CD and we'd put the CD in a cartridge and we'd put the cartridge in a computer. A cold desert, any large arid area of land that typically receives scant amounts of annual precipitation 
which occurs mainly in the form of snow or fog. The upper limit of mean annual precipitation is often considered to be fewer than 25 centimeters or about 9 inches or 10 inches. However, sources vary. Cold deserts are found typically in temperate regions at high elevations on plateaus or in mountainous areas. However, they also occur in polar regions. Shrubs and grasses are the main types of vegetation, and most plants and other organisms have adaptations that enable them to survive the dry, frigid conditions. Cold deserts are located at higher latitudes than deserts situated in tropical and subtropical climates, and thus they experience colder temperatures, especially in the winter. They're found in Central Asia, Western North America, Southeastern South America, Antarctica, and the Arctic. Now, you can read more about the temperatures, uh, the fluctuations here. There's, uh, there's examples from our real world that maybe one of these uh, you really you glom onto and you say, aha. Uh, Virga, not offhand, uh, Delport. Uh, not, not as a, a weather phenomena. Uh, so, yep, it'll explore the Himalayas, uh, the Gobi Desert here. Um, it'll talk about the different animals that have adapted to live in these harsh uh, conditions that uh, include wild Bactrian camels, jabronis. Oh, I didn't. Wow, that's where that's where the jabronis come from. Uh, jerboas, pit vipers, black tailed gazelles and snow leopards. Uh, so again, I'm I'm not going to read the uh, the entire here. Uh, you can th there's all sorts of things that you can use to consider and populate your fantasy world, or you might go. You know what? I I'm tired of the real world, and I don't want the real world in my fantasy world. In my fantasy world, satyrs are dragonborn and uh, tieflings, just a as an ar archaeological concept. And elves are presumably extinct. And was that is they had full skeletons, but also these weird half skeletons that formed this concept of a satyr. It evaporates as it falls. Uh, so that that might be what the uh, I mean, if not a very traditional fog, that might end up being something that is a consideration for this area too, Delport. Is that would be kind of kind of a fog. It'd be a high up fog if it's evaporating, but it doesn't reach the ground. Yeah, in this case though, lead, we're just talking about the concept of a satyr. We're we're not invoking our real world uh, Greek traditional presentation of a satyr. We're taking concepts that can construct a satyr, or are commonly attributed to them. But given what we've already generated in our workshop, uh, we don't need to take this literally and tie it to our real world. Uh, we're honoring the spirit of the prompt uh, by giving uh, an archaeological, uh, historical, even perhaps a, a religious bend to what these creatures were to the current inhabitants of this place. So you can read about polar deserts as well, because in our uh, in our settlement concept, we had an Arctic biome and a desert biome. They could be separate. They could be overlapping in some way. Uh, the people who live here have formed a confederacy. So various uh, clans or tribes or city states uh, are well to keep to themselves. But there is a seeding of some kind of central power or authority that helps keep everyone in check, probably regulates trade, uh, etc. Uh, but you can uh, you can check out, I'll keep this up here for a moment, if you were not here for the last part of our workshop. That way you can, and I'll bring this back up too, but I want to talk about elements 
that we can understand and extrapolate or step sideways from uh, for our fantasy world. <clears throat> Pardon me. Sorry, everyone. Of course, you also learn some interesting language going through here. An extremophile microorganism or a psychrophile organism. These are creatures that need the cold to live. <clears throat> now, we are going over to Wikipedia. I am using this for conceptual reference, of course. Never, ever, 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 ever use Wikipedia as a primary source. You can use it to lead you to other sources that you can cite in any sort of report, but never, ever, 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 ever use Wikipedia as a primary source. But as we're talking about a fantasy world, where ultimately it doesn't matter if someone uh, came in here, uh, swapped something up, vandalized something, or whatever... This is fine. This is going to be enough to introduce us to concepts, and we can move forward from there. Did I say never use Wikipedia as a primary source? Because I'm repeating what I hope all of your teachers have told you throughout your schooling. All right, let's continue. Uh, as there were concepts of the monsoon season, rainy season that happens in summertime. Um, whether that's in summer, well, maybe here it is. In other regions, if you're basing it off our real world, it might happen in the autumn or the spring, but the spring might be the autumn or the, the winter might be the summer to the northern hemisphere, depending on you know which side of the planet you're on. Blah, blah, blah. The concept here is after a rainy season, even in deserts, you will have effects like a desert bloom. It is a climactic phenomenon that occurs in various deserts around the world. The phenomenon consists of the blossoming of a wide variety of flowers uh, during early to mid spring years when rainfall is unusually high. Now, in this case, we might be able to just replace that with the summer, the summer storms or whatever. The blossoming occurs when the unusual level of rainfall reaches seeds and bulbs that have been in a latent or dormant state and causes them to germinate and flower in early spring. So here are examples where you have a desert that during most of most of the year looks more like this. But once that that sweet, sweet, fresh water rolls in, might even flood the place for a couple days. Look like an absolute disaster. How can anything thrive here? It absorbs down. And the desert floor explodes with life. The desert had the potential for life within it. The seeds have adapted to be able to spend months, maybe a year, two years more, without a lot, if any, moisture. Maybe they even uh, adapt to store the water, like succulents, like cacti. There's a lot of animal life that may also, uh, that will also uh, come around uh, in a flood season, a rainy season, a monsoon season. So this is just an example of, uh, of the desert and its flowers. Now, I was trying to find, there's a, a type of a, I think it's like a mud skipper. And for any of you out there, uh, Delport or anyone who might know, there's a type of, I think it's a mud skipper or a catfish. And I want to say, I want to say it's in the, uh, the deserts uh, out in Africa that after their rainy season, uh, the fish eggs actually act like the seeds where in the mud of the river basins and the lakes that are dry for uh, a lot of the rest of the year, 
these uh, frog or fish eggs will lie dormant under the mud that has like been baked over. When the rainy season hits, these eggs like super mature and these fish and amphibians and everything uh, just grow wildly because everything is in a frenzy for the water and the nutrients, everything that flushes down. You can even look to the, the flooding season of the Nile uh, if you want other examples. Um, but I was trying to find it during the break and I couldn't. But I'm pretty certain that there is a, a fish and or a frog that will lay its eggs in the muddy remains at the end of the wet season. And those eggs will sustain the rest of the dry, hot, crusty year until the next flood. The next generation spawns, eats, uh, you know, answers nature's call, lays their eggs. This is all in the course of a couple months. And then they go dormant until the next cycle begins again. Next year, or two years, or five years from now. Who knows? Um, but uh, this is a... Uh, you might go, wait, there's fish in Arizona? There is. I know many of you might... Th it's a shame Kragar went to sleep. Uh, many of you might think Arizona is just, you know, an endless wasteland of dunes and desert and, you know... Who, who would want to live in Arizona? There's like a mountain and a cactus there, at least in all the, all the cartoons I've watched that feature this state. Th there is plant life. There is fish. There are fish in Arizona. So if you go through, you can read what are the types of... Uh, what are the types of uh, fish that live in such an environment? that might actually have wet and dry cycles. Not quite the one that I had in mind. Uh-oh. All right, ah. Uh, welcome raiders in from none other than, how do you pronounce your name? Macabre Derek. Derek is French, isn't it? Well, welcome Macabre uh, Derek. Uh, thank you very much for the raid. Uh, and I, uh, hi Goblin of Gygaxonor, welcome to you as well. Um. Oh, my cab driver Dirk. He's a cabbie. Oh, okay. And thank you for the shout out, Raven. Uh, to my cab driver, Dirk. But if you go and you, you want to read, maybe your goal in life is you need to make contact with a Razorback sucker. Or at least you go down to Arizona because you want to find a desert sucker. I wish you well in your search because I'm sure that you'll find one. Um, but you can read about the different types of, uh, of cichlids, pupfish and catfish, minnows, in this case a top minnow. Uh, do you, do you all want to, you want to get a chub in Arizona? Go to Arizona, you'll get a chub, you'll find a sucker, and uh, and there we go. The rifle, the rifle foo is ready. Sir, I have, I have no idea what you're talking about. Uh, I feel as if you're impugning my honor. <clears throat> so, uh, uh, I, I'm going to, uh, I, I'm just going to keep moving on. That's catfishing, yeah. Yeah, so... Uh, hey, Noctis, good to see you. So, yeah, you uh, you can go catfishing in Arizona, and you'll find chubs and suckers. Read about that, right? 
whether or not like the Arizona desert is not in uh, a, a temperate desert, a cold desert, nor even a polar desert. Now, uh, Derek can speak with some authority about uh, about cold deserts. Um, or at least uh, lives, you know, in enough proximity to one to be dangerous. Uh, though he might be more of a, of a in a woods type of guy. But if you go and you read about this and you go, you know what? I like how this looks. And whether or not I actually know how, uh, you know, how that works. Um, you know, whether or not you want a, uh, you know, a mouthful of sucker. Um, or you get a yucky chub, then, by the way, everyone, even leaning into Macabre Derek's name, I hope you're enjoying the candor, the wordplay, the innuendo. Just because it's PG-13 doesn't mean we can't have fun, and I do love all of you down in Arizona. Um, so you can, uh, you can have... Uh, fun and and nothing says that just because this grows in more of a tropical or subtropical climate desert that you can't have um that you can't have something like this in your polar if you find out how it works in our real world do whatever you need to do to adjust it to exist in your fantasy world and and please always Always be happy to make a, that distinction. If our satyrs are actually dragonborn and tieflings, whose uh, remains uh, were simply just because of mixed up archaeological finds, cool. That might be a super unique setting. So tiefling and dragonborn don't actually exist, but they did. And this is what the current people here think of the people who used to live in this region. And have created a myth, a folk tale, a fairy tale, even a history. Maybe they left some sort of writing or hieroglyphics uh, behind. Some sort of symbols. There's a lot of ruins. Ruins, if you prefer. This story is writing itself before our very eyes. <coughs> the current people... <coughs> Oh, pardon. The current people who live here are gnomes and dwarves. And if you want to be specific, we technically rolled rock gnomes and hill dwarves. Um, if you just say, no, nah, I'm happy with both kinds of uh, gnomes and dwarves, you might say, well, there's not a forest. Well, forest gnome as a concept can live in other natural terrain. Um, it's just in a, maybe a more traditional, uh, Western or like, a, a Northwestern European sense, uh, gnomes are much more foresty creatures because the concept of a gnome was born out of that region, which has, uh, huge tracts of land. And by that, I mean lush forests just growing up out of the ground like this. And so... That's clearly where the gnomes come from. Or the mountains. Yeah. And the dwarves. Huh. Wasn't it uh, Sawtooth that was talking about how uh, Fafnir was a dwarf that was corrupted by greed and turned into a dragon? Huh. Maybe there's something to this. And you can take that similar concept and you can run with it just straight up or you can take a step aside and move in a direction parallel or at a, a slightly askew. <clears throat> well, if you're greedy enough, Woden, uh, you turn into a monster that hoards treasure from other people uh, a clearly inhuman thing a ferocious beast that all should fear now the form of the dragon was just what was considered at that time uh, to be a super scary thing you didn't want to be 
Now about a third of the art I see online are dragons where people are getting very close to them. So interesting how culture shifts. Uh, the role of the monster, uh, maybe even uh, to whatever, uh, you know, lie, slander, and misinformation Derek was trying to sling at me, uh, even ponderous uh, metallic monsters uh, in a different time, in a different culture, might actually become things of attraction or desire. So... Oh, yeah, Lunar Silver Star Story. Yeah. So this was the setting that we made, and we have, uh, we've referenced, uh, and uh, did I, put, I don't know if I put this uh, in chat here. Cite your sources, kids. And remember, Wikipedia is good to think about things, but should never be used as a primary source. There we go. I think I said that for the 10th time. Let's uh, let's continue, or let's continue, uh, especially because we just talked about extremophiles, psychophiles, and even zero uh, zero phylous plants as well as animal species, including the tuco tuco and the four eyed frog. Well then. I don't know. All these kind of cryptid sound and stuff. I think we're dealing more with the X-Files here. But that's part of the fun of world building. You know, if you want another good example, take a look at Avatar The Last Airbender. How many times did they take one animal and uh, pineapple pen it with another animal? And it was a creature as natural as as anything else that exists in that world. Ah, uh, yes, he does spread lies and deceit, I suppose. Now, with that background, Derek, you might want to look away because, um, yeah, Bomo was a lemur with bat wings. Uh, I am going, I'm, I'm going to have, I'm going to produce art. That might very well make Derek shiver with disgust. <laughs> I am using paint. And I am using a traditional mouse that is on a purely horizontal axis in order to make this map. But let's see what we can do. Ah, so you have an Arctic desert uh, specifically located within your house, Lead Snappin'. I am going to cast Produce Art. And by the way, I do this. I, I do suggest if you have an artist that is a friend of yours, a family member, or that travels in similar social circles, please do let them draw for you. Commission them, challenge them, and if they're willing to accept, awesome. Don't be afraid to ask for something that might be outside the norm. Maybe for you, there would be uh, something special. You know, I don't normally draw mechs, but for you, I'll give it a try. Uh, hi, Silas. So, uh, uh, you know, engage with your friendly local artist, but also don't be afraid to start that journey yourself. With me using MS Paint and a normal mouse, I want to show how we can go from something like this to a unique presentation, even a, a very simple and bold presentation that you don't necessarily need a lot of skills in order to, uh, in order to present your idea to other people. Can it always be made more better? Yes, of course. You can use better tools, more powerful tools. You can refine your own uh, logic in how you layer your drawings or build stuff out, or you form your own technique. 
In fact, I believe it was Derek in one of his streams that said artists are... An artist's style is well known because the style is actually the flaws and the errors in that artist's interpretation of reality. If I want to see reality, I will either see reality myself or I will come close with an approximation of an untampered photograph. But when you look at art and you go, oh, this piece is a so-and-so, well, how do you know? Oh, I can tell because of, uh, I can tell because of the way the eyes are drawn. To that artist, that artist had a, a particular refinement for drawing eyes in a consistent manner. Do some people have eyes like that artist? Of course. But everyone in that art? And so an artist is known for their deficits between what is presented and what is real. That is where your style is born and where you get to be known for what you create. And if you go, I can't do art. I can't make a map. I haven't studied topography. Get out of here with that. I'm going to show you how you can do it right now. And we can add topography later. If you say you can't draw a person, what are you talking about? Is this not a person? Is this not a person? Is this not a person? Uh, you, you don't count, Derek. Get out of here. <laughs> All of these are people. And yet, look at the vast differences. And then, uh, here, I'm going to, like, speed draw. Like, oh, da 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 I just drew a person. You don't believe me? You don't believe me that I just drew a person. How dare you? We have a person with a very heavy brow. Oops. Kind of a cheek jowl thing going on. Sharp cheeks. Very sharp cheeks. Still has a, a pretty good mess of hair. I, do I consider myself an artist? No. All I did, all I did was wiggle my mouse randomly on this screen and I made a person. Who is this person? I don't know. Let's snap and says it's mommy. Uh, Goblin of Gygaxner says it's an osprey. Pardon. So, I don't want to hear that none of you can draw. And just because you don't have a background in, um... Just because you don't have a background in geography, geology, topography, ecology, whatever ology you want. Okay? You know what we're going to do to make a desert? We're going to go to the fill tool and we're going to say this looks like sand color and congratulations, ye be gods. 
We just created a desert. You're welcome. Now, if there is going to be some kind of a civilization, unless the people in your fantasy world are different somehow, you want to make this like Dune, where there's actually very little moisture and it's recycled? Cool. In many more traditional senses, there must be a source of water some way, somehow. And what would happen... From all of the clues that we have generated with our cold desert, we know that there's ruins. There must be water somewhere, or at least there was, or maybe it only arrives during the rainy season, the monsoon season, the season when uh, something shifts and changes, or when the fog rolls down from the peripheral mountains or comes down uh, where there's actually rain, but it almost evaporates all the way until it almost hits. And so it's not even a rainy season. Everything just gets very damp and foggy for a while. When I was in Lima, Peru, that was the rain that we got. When I was there, that was like one of the very one of the 10 days of the year that it rains and the rain was a mist. Now, while we didn't have a mountain biome specifically, you make the call. Do you want mountains at least uh, at least way on the periphery? Sure. Why don't we do something like that? Let's give it a try. Uh, what color is uh, rock? Eh, you know what? Let's go with uh, brown. Why not? And let's say that there's... Uh, when? Where am I getting this? My imagination. Because you know what you can do? You can erase this and go back to what you want. If you say, oh, I, I want a mountain here, and I want a mountain here, and we're going to put one here, and then, oh, I'm going to put one that looks totally like an exclamation point right here, and then there's going to be one, and this is going to be a clue to a great mystery the ancients left. And then you sit back and you go, you know, uh, they weren't bad ideas at the time, but maybe I should have rethought this. You know what you do? You know, here, we these are fully fleshed out mountains in the desert. And why not? You change the concept, or what you do is you go back here, and you've just reclaimed the mountains. It's just that easy to build a world, to create something that is your own. All you have to do is grab that pencil and start making something. Just start. So let's put some peripheral mountains on here, shall we? Now, there's different ways mountains can come about. Um, you can research plate tectonics if you wish. You can research why there are deserts. For example, why Peru is a desert nation for the most part. What keeps the water from reaching Peru? The answer to that is the Andes Mountains. As the winds blow east to west in the southern hemisphere, all of the hot, moist air from the rainforest uh, blows across South America, and as it ramps up the Andes Mountains, it freezes into snow, or it recondenses and falls back down the mountain to slosh right back into the into the rainforest. Only a little bit of that moisture crests the mountain and falls in the deserts of Peru. And yet I, I assure you there is life in that desert. There there has been primitive life. If you go back to all the animal uh, mounds, like all the, the shapes and everything. And there's modern life there as well. That doesn't have to rely on, on desalination or something. So you go, all right, well, you know, we're going to put mountains here. Why not? But maybe mountains don't necessarily play a huge part. In fact, if we have, maybe this is kind of an isolated area, right? If we have kind of a self-sustaining confederacy 
of peoples, of tribes, of city-states, of uh, bloodlines or clans or whatever. We might even take this back and we're going to go... We're going to say that this map barely hints at the, at the fact that these dwarves and gnomes might be living in a cutoff way from a very ubiquitous and pervasive mountain range. And why not? Put a little squiggle there, because we can. We'll put a little one there too. Why not? And we'll actually say that there's a hole in the mountain, dear Liza, dear Liza, because why not? And let's see what happens. Well, there is a landslide. Uh, just millions of people died, and we've actually made the society that we just created extinct. Uh, so congratulations to us. Now, much like with any good political espionage, we have to find the leak. So we come back here, and we find out where we missed a pixel to let things through. That might have been it. Yeah, that was it. We did it, chat. Hi, uh, Covert Psyop. I've been, yes, uh, Covert, uh, your, uh, your name played into your introduction, and welcome to you, Covert Psyop. Uh, all of you have actually been captured into a 101 level, uh, you know, associate's degree collegiate class. So, you know, uh, it, I guess it would play into the, uh, you know, yeah, you thought you were in a ghost story. Well, you're in one. Um... Well, nanner nanner boo boo. Uh, and welcome to you, Covert. Uh, however you found us, welcome to the Hero Zone. And you're welcome to participate, ask questions, or share stories as you'd like. Banter is also always welcome. Now, where would our source of water be? Uh, you know, on Tatooine in Star Wars, it was actually a vapor farm. Maybe this whole area is just foggy, and that's their wet season. And there might be, uh, you know, moisture collectors. <coughs> Pardon. Um, in the, uh, the Chinese element cycle, uh, you have... You have five elements. This is obviously not to scale. <laughs> In the cycle. And we have earth, metal, water, grass or trees, and fire and if you follow the cycle based on the observations of the people at the time from earth metal was extracted from metal water was extracted now stop why is this why would why would a civilization as a part of a an initial fundamental way of thinking about the world say that water comes from metal is this pure bunk is this just pure superstition with no basis in any kind of observed reality why does water come from metal
Let me do this. You, uh, you're spending a hot summer day uh, digging in your garden. It gets late and the mosquitoes are biting. You lean your shovel against your house and you go inside to sleep. Because you have to get up early the next morning and continue digging your, your farm or your garden. You wake up in the morning, it's the crack of dawn, and you go out of your house and you grab your shovel. What do you see? I go swarm. Good to see you. What do you see on your shovel? Dew. The dew would accumulate on the metal. Else why would it rust or why would there be droplets of water? From water grows trees, crops, grass, plants, because they need water to live. Fire is born from the wood that you burn, the grass that you burn. And why is earth born from fire? Why would Earth be born from fire? Uh, I mean, in a sense, volcanoes. Because it does spread lava. Ashes. Volcanoes make land. And also, where, where the fire... It doesn't even have to be a volcano. If a wildfire destroys a forest what's left empty land you've uncovered the earth and so too with that why does ground destroy fire if you cover a fire in sand or dirt, it will be exterminated. So, earth destroys fire. Fire destroys plant life. Plant life consumes and destroys water. Water consumes and destroys metal. The rust. Metal destroys earth because you can dig into it mold it shape it and mine it now you can go with a concept like this you could stick with a traditional four elements of you know fire earth wind and water more of i think that's the the classic uh greek explanation of the elements uh if you want to include either uh you know, uh, a fifth element of love as per, uh, you know, Captain Planet or uh, or not even that uh, heart or in uh, fifth element, the movie. Uh, if you don't want to have metal, but you want the five elements like the five rings, you have uh, fire, earth, water and air. But then you also have the void, which could have been that space in between. However, maybe you have it all. There's trees. There's squoils. We'll bless them all. Yeah, in that case, water begets water and water destroys water, Covert. And Marco, yes, there there is not just a literal interpretation. You can read into it. Uh, more is uh, more on that point, too. Yes. The doctor, doctor gets the reference, so thank you. So anyway, 
we need to have water. And if we said that our rock gnomes and hill dwarves might actually have moved in at some point, but created a more underground area, or they found one because maybe this place was reclaimed. Well, there could be a concept of uh, a city that we could draw on top, but really, well, we knew that we know that there's an ancient wall. Could the ancient wall be literally or metaphorically the mountains that surround this place? Or was it something manufactured? Let's say it was manufactured, kind of a, a great wall sort of a thing, right? And, uh, and what do we want to do? We, we don't want it to be the random erosion of water or wind and sand. Uh, we know that the previous people who lived here built this ruined wall. And let's say that uh, we have it... I don't know. If, if we're saying elves and... Uh, whatever these half-creatures, these satyrs are, that uh, we're having trouble distinguishing between dragonborn and tieflings uh, because both of them have uh, wings and or backwards knees uh, and or uh, horns or whatever uh, from the records. So if, if we do that, if, if we're playing into it, elves have pointy ears, uh, tieflings and dragons might have horns. So let's say that there was some sort of a symbolism to that and that there's a ruined wall that looks like something like this. I never claimed I'm an artist, but I'm still getting my point across to you. I hope you can see. <clears throat> and maybe this could be uh, this could be a compass along the lines of at least what was then magnetic north or you know like some sort of a true north. This could simply be a symbol uh, that f must face another direction. <coughs> you know, we're <coughs> pardon. We have the northwest, the northeast, so it's it's the halves. If we have a, a society of halves. Tieflings, Dragonborn, Half-Elves, Satyrs, right? Maybe it's at those halfway points between the actual cardinal directions. Why not? Talk yourself into the story. Let the story write itself. It will happen. We have all of our notes from the workshops that we did. These are all randomly generated through the process we used, and yet they work together. It will write itself. And with your creativity, you can draw everything together. Uh-oh, hang on a moment. Yeah, uh, old boulders and mountains being built by giants. Maybe the mountains were man-made, uh, but uh, by another civilization. Exactly, Marco. In fact, you know what I'll do? We just had that. We've been talking about the Gobi Desert. Uh, why don't I take you all to the steps? Give me a moment here. I gotta find where my, my Mongolian step music went to. That's not just the raid notification, but hello, Voivode uh, Kohotek. Uh, welcome to you. Uh, if Ravenstar doesn't get to it here in a second, I promise to give you a shout out as soon as I find the uh, the music I'm looking for. Which we're going to go to historical music. That is a Wuja tea house, not quite. Oasis City. Yeah. I want I want my I want my step music. Help me step music. I'm stuck. Where are you, step music? Why isn't under historical? No, let's just look under pure music then.
Oh, this is killing me. I guess I'm gonna have to go back to all- oh, there it is, the steps. Okay, here we go. Uh, let's give a shout out to Voivode Kohotek. That's you. Oh, I misspelled your name. Shout out. There we go. And uh, tonight was your arena combat in D&D, correct? Uh, Haven, hello. Welcome. Excellent. I hope that the arena combat was awesome for you then. All right. So we're applying what we generated before. Lean into it. Have fun with it. Uh, so we have this wall, the ruins of a wall. Now, we also developed a ruined statue of a deity. Maybe there was some important statue in the center of this once thriving civilization. Okay. Oh, would you look at that? That is completely a representation of the god or goddess that these ancient people worshipped. Except maybe I should draw it on its side. Oh, no. Heck. That's fine. I can do this. Know enough to be dangerous, everyone. And there you go. Now, if you want the ruined statue, if you say, no, 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 no. We are actually going to put this ruined statue. Um, we are going to put the ruined statue, uh, kind of like the, the big Rio de Janeiro uh, statue of Jesus the Savior, right? We're going to put this uh, this ruined statue up here because you know what? We, we did kind of randomly, we did kind of randomly have a carve out for whatever, but this makes sense. What if this was a sacred area that has been hidden for a while that the, that everyone would travel to and, and worship or could have been a cult. Who knows? It's in the past. <coughs> and from what our what we studied about cold deserts, there could even be dry riverbeds. <coughs> pardon, dry riverbeds that flow through the place or around the place. Maybe, in fact, there's a dry riverbed here. And that at one point in time... Maybe this was a glacier that got dug out or something. Who knows? The meltwater would come in and the old the old civilization uh, might have routed the water from the mountains. In fact, what if even that's what uh, part of the point of the points were? Were some sort of an aqueduct? Or, or they followed an old riverbed course? Ask yourself what if? Tell yourself a story that you're not sure about. In this program, it is so easy to go back and fix your mistakes. But let your creative juices flow. We're talking about a fantasy world with ancient civilizations that don't have to conform to what we know about our current real world. In fact, many times, I dare say, we play these games to get away from our real world. I know it's a controversial take, but... <sighs> I wish I could help you, Haven. Uh, I do not use D&D Beyond, so I don't know how that software functions. Um, if anyone out there uses D&D Beyond, can you please give Haven some advice? in what to look for in order to make a custom build. Covert? Yep. I want people to create. Not that they that they shouldn't care. They should. Creation is a uh, is fueled by passion. Fueled by ideas, crazy or not. And if you don't like something, 
you are as a god in your own world. You are the creator and the destructor. You are the alpha and the omega. And if you don't want riverbeds that led through an, an ancient crumpled aqueduct system that maybe people are like, this is a weird lumpy road because it just collapsed, right? So there's no actual aqueducts and there's really no water left anymore. Everyone's like, oh, this was a trade center. They all just followed these weird, very uneven roads. What happened? Maybe there was an earthquake. Oh, of course. Because we already have our society mixing up dragonborn and tieflings. As these weird, like, half, whatever these elf things are. Who I haven't heard of an elf, have you? We only have gnomes and dwarves that live here. No one's ever seen or heard of a dragonborn or, or tiefling. The fossil records show that they're pretty much the same thing. So we have something like this. And in Covert, don't forget to add, we have Mongolian throat singing going on in the background, too. I got you, my friend. Uh, in fact, uh, we are a... Uh, we have a, uh, a Chad dragon. There you are. I wish I could render high-quality 3D models straight from my imagination. I mean, one day, uh, Covert... Uh, through Neuralink or some other sort of uh, cyberpunk dystopia, utopia, or something in between. Um, we might be getting closer. But until then, program yourself. You can do it. Do it the old-fashioned way. You program yourself to make the high-quality art. You have that ability, which is pretty cool for a machine to be able to self uh, to self-grow and especially, it's, it's a baffling thing that we also self-limit, where we actively go out of our, our way to not grow. So, I don't know, consider it. So anyway, we have our, we have our ruined statue, we have our ruined walls, and somewhere also is a boulder carved with talking faces. Now, is that a part of the ancient civilization? Could that be something built that is new by the dwarves and the gnomes that moved in here after the fall of the old civilization? They, they escaped to this desert. And if they were building underground, maybe that's actually where the water is seeping. In many cases, if you run into an oasis in a desert, it's because the groundwater has seeped down from uh, glacial melt or snow melt underwater and kind of like an artesian well finds an area that it can no longer seep. So there might be some rocks here that prevent the seepage. And so it wells up. All that snow melt gets filtered uh, through the sand or the bedrock, the limestone or whatever. Just like I understand, a lot of people are getting filtered by a helicopter in Armored Core 6. So imagine you're playing Armored Core 6 and you're getting filtered by one of the bosses. That's the process that the snow melt goes through under the desert until it hits this, this end. And then it wells up, and that's your oasis. So there very well may be underwater resources. And we know that we have gnome, we have rock gnomes and hill dwarves uh, who are very happy to diggy diggy hole. Whether that is just a part of their intrinsic custom as a people, or by sheer environmental necessity to avoid the heat of the sun the scouring winds of the desert, or even if there's a rainy season in the summer, the torrential rains that actually do flood through the desert and might even cause some interesting blooms of flora or fauna or something magical. What if that boulder, the boulder is ready? What if that boulder with many faces You know what? We just described how an oasis works. 
What if the boulder of many faces is... If there are flash floods in the desert, it's a warning. It's a warning. And what will... Do, uh, do you remember... Uh, what was the name of the Transformers with... Uh, what was the name of the Transformers with the five heads? Uh, like uh, a Penta... Penta somethings? There's got to be a nerd out there that knows. It should be me, but I forget. Ah, that's right. Quintessons. Thank you. What if as an early warning system that this civilization built, there is the boulder with the, the talking faces is something because the, the concept of Mount Rushmore came up. What if uh, some faces, whoops, I'll draw this in gray because we made the other artifice gray as well. The boulder is an extension of the mountain that's been carved out. I don't know. We have three. It could be more. I don't know. What do you want? And there are there are faces that might have at one time looked like the people who used to live here, but unfortunately have been worn down, which hasn't helped the fossil record any. Anyway, when when the melt begins as summer comes, as the summer storms blow against the mountains, causing an excess of moisture to peak over the top even, the faces begin to weep and water will trickle and pour from the faces. Maybe it's a tiered system where they well up in different ways to indicate how much water is now coming down. Why not? This is your fantasy world. Is that badass? Is that cool? Or do you go, eh, I don't, I don't want to do a Mount Rushmore that weeps meltwater in the summer. Okay, then don't. But that, that's a cool idea, and we wouldn't have thought about it unless we made arbitrary lines on a map. And this is very much a map. Why wouldn't it be? Yep, exactly. The faces are weeping. Rain's a-coming. Do they need these faces? No. But maybe you just put placeholders as ideas. Because if you live in an area that's prone to flash floods, you want a warning. That's a, for as creepy as that might be, that this is actually a lifesaver. And in fact, what was it that we ended up making? We have our persons, our personas, or our personifications of our holidays, or our holiday in the summer. Speaks in rhyme or some peculiar way, prone to singing, whistling, or humming. Pardon. Maybe flower, flowery speech. Wait a minute. Flowery speech. So the water that pours from the one face might actually be the thing that causes... What was it that we looked up? The Desert Bloom! Of course! It's been in there the whole time. And if you don't like it, you can erase it. No one will. Your players won't know. Your players won't know. You can also add it in after the fact if they think it's a cool idea. And you go, yep, yep, yep. Ah, the whole time. I'm glad that, you know what? You must be really keen. You caught on to my world building. <laughs> secret, secret tip for all of you. Anyway. This is just the surface level. 
and you might go, all right, well, so if the rainy season blows in this way, maybe the general fog that accumulates is because for some reason, like there's just clouds that pour in over, over the surface otherwise. And our, our rainy season is a foggy season, but there is actually times where a, a flooding rain does come through. What else? We know that our our gnomes and our dwarves live in harmony and that the ruler of this confederacy of different, you know, clans or bloodlines or city states uh, is respected, fair and just. There is a notable academy here. Was this built? Maybe this was excavated. Maybe if this was a city of some kind of learning or it was repurposed because there was a bunch of documents in it. It was well built out of stone. But unfortunately, the paper inside of it, you know, sand, sand can do wonders stripping down leather, paper, flesh. So why don't we put our academy somewhere? We'll put our academy. You know what? Maybe this used to be a great big public building to the society that lived here. And the academy is the central hub, of course. For the, the clans, the bloodlines, the city-states that have taken up residence in the arms here. And now just, I don't know, I'm going to put colored circles here. Do the colored circles mean anything? Not right now, they, and they don't need to. But what I need to do is indicate to myself that this is an idea that I'm having that we can always go back and eradicate or that we'll embrace and we'll move forward in some way. So we'll say we have a confederacy of the of four peoples or tribes or whatever. Of gnomes and dwarves. And if you ever want to reclaim it to the desert, you do this. And it's like it, it would never happened. Anyway. So now we've built our confederacy. We've built our ruins. We have an idea of the people who used to live here and those that now do live here. And all of this is bringing everything that we've generated together so far. So there's a notable academy. And we learn that currently the calamity here isn't so much about flooding, is that religious sects struggle for power. And I think that's because this old god, this toppled god, was uncovered. Maybe this has just opened up. What if these people have found this cove of treasures, of influence, of learning or knowledge. And through the central government of the Confederacy are trying to instill this religion, this culture into the independent peoples that form the Confederacy. After all, we did learn that we have a villain personification of these people or of a holiday and remember not all holidays are because of good people many are but not everyone but we had a villain who is an undead with an ideal of knowledge who is trying to contact a lost deity by interfering with politics through espionage or spying And as, as you're talking about Marco, he is a thief rogue noble by background. And so Marco was saying, inspired by ye olden Mesopotamian days, royals and nobles might show off their status with lush gardens, showing their worthiness as a leader by how well they can bring life to a harsh environment. Yeah, how well can you cultivate and, and grow life? that you can offer at least the illusion of prosperity or that you can bring water, irrigation, grain, and nourishment 
If only the people would keep you in power through their faith, through their politics, or through tolerating your uh, your tyranny. It can be that too, Covert. If you want to make a uh, Behilet, uh, and it, it actually shifts. So maybe inside this monument, there's old gears that turn or something along those lines. So as the water starts pouring through the pipe, uh, you know, the piping and the gear works, the faces arrange until it hits a critical point. At which case the faces open up and the water starts pouring out. And that's your indication that there is catastrophe, calamity, omen, or something on the horizon. Get behind the walls when they were still up. The walls were actually built perhaps to contain the water in a way, maybe to dam it, not just leak off a little bit through the aqueducts. And that, much like the Nile River flooding annually, this was actually fertile farmland. That, yes, it was a disastrous flood, but through modern engineering and sensibilities, they could control nature, said the extinct species. Covert, these are just workshops to get everyone to think. Ways to give you tools to use or modify yourself such that you can world build without straining your brain, without running out of brain juice. All of these exercises I do are participatory. They're through discussion and they can be infinitely modified to your unique circumstances. But my purpose overall is to just get you all to think, to be inspired, to Bust through. Oh, thank you. Of course, Covert Psyop gets the Snake Eater uh, soundtrack. Uh, it was it was supposed to be that way the whole time. There you go, Covert Psyop. That one's going out to you, my friend. Anyway. Uh, actually accompanied with, uh, all right. <clears throat> <coughs> Pardon. In my profession, I see so many people who have a story in their hearts, who want to tell something great, but for some reason are having trouble manifesting the confidence to do so. These workshops are my way to help bust through these feelings of reservation, anxiousness, awkwardness, or just to be that fire you needed under your butt to start creating. Just start creating and your story will write itself as we've seen happen every workshop and i'm using the core three well technically two but i'm only using core rule books i'm i'm not relying on splat books official or third party we're keeping this as vanilla as possible and finding in six years of these workshops infinite variations have you ever been in a world where dragonborn and tieflings uh you know don't exist but not just because you have a dm that say no it's humans only in my fantasy world we're keeping it low fantasy low magic or you know Everyone is a is a human fighter, and that's it. And that that's what every adventure in this world is. Because you might have that. In this case, we're allowing for tieflings and dragonborn to exist. They just don't currently, and their and their remains have been mixed up. 
such that they're not seen by the modern society as necessarily uh, two different uh, species or races or people. They're just some variants of the same type of person. And then there's these weird... You have the people who are... Uh, you, you have people who have a uh, very similar bone structure uh, to the gnomes and to the dwarves, except they tend to be taller and, and thinner, the elves. But something happened where many of them ended up getting these like backward knees and animalistic features like horns. What happened to the, the elves or whatever you'd want to call them in this world? So technically, elves, dragonborn, and, and tieflings don't exist anymore in this world. They're just a very jumbled up, confused fossil record. Or at least an anthropological, if not fossilized. It's a desert. Mummified. Or just their old, dry bones. DDM says, in my world, halflings are dying out. In the game I ran for Captain Milne, they found some evidence of the halfling that may have been responsible for it. Ah. Uh, if you want, Doctor, I have an emote for you. You can drop an F-bomb as per the emote if you want. Oh, I mean, the acronym FUBAR is fine, too. But, of course, if I don't shill for myself and my BTTV emotes, who will? You know what, though, Covert? I have heard the definition of insanity... And yet we get different results every time. So clearly, we're not insane. And if you if you don't want to drop an F-bomb, you can also just say heck. You know who the deity of this desert was? The Great Goblin. Here we see the Great Goblin creating... That fallen statue. The goblin, the perfect being. Maybe not. But, uh, I don't know. You can consider it. After all, how many of us with beliefs or religions or through stories and folklore have made up creatures that don't actually exist in our world and yet we treat with veneration or respect or whatever? So maybe the ancestors worshipped goblins. Who knows? In fact, Covert PSYOP, uh, if you, I don't know if you have BTTV uh, installed, you actually summoned our prize goblin uh, with, uh, with that. As that's what appeared when you said what you did. Marco says, some DMs ramble all day, some are quiet and let the players drive things. As long as you can describe the necessary elements of a scene, you're good. That is a quick and dirty way of putting it, Marco. Absolutely. Now, we know that there is actually a, a, a religious building that is important to the current people. A temple to a good deity of some kind. Oh, good gob. There's always, there's always something. And where would that be? Is that a central... It, would that be the complement... Uh, to the academy, do we have a distinction between, uh, you know, logic and feeling of proof and belief? Maybe. Maybe by serving both aspects, uh, that's what helps uh, bind this confederacy together by being able to explore these uh, these questions. You know, for for every high rule, there is a low rule, my friends. In fact, here we'll we'll play into that. I have a nice uh, I have a nice yellow, and then we have the opposite of yellow down here, uh, which probably means that I should do this. There we go. And there's this place called the Slaughtered Seder. Is that in the core government sector of the Confederacy? Is it maybe there's actually a pretty steady trickle of water? I don't know. Let, let's say that there is. There's a lot of mountain range here. And in fact, this this is a, a very direct connection. Let's let's actually make this. Um, 
a, a stream. A desert can have water in it. A desert's more about the precipitation. So let's say that uh, this is uh, the water tribe of the Confederacy or something, right? And uh, and it's it's close to the farmland, so to speak. This is wine country, after all, as well. Uh, as per our, uh, you know, as per our uh, our thing here. And so uh, we might have. Uh, th this might actually end up being like our Nile. This might be our area where there is a lot of cultivation. This is the breadbasket of our current society. And so let's put let's put some at least grassy area here, okay? And we're gonna go back through and we're gonna reclaim this idea to the desert. But if you want to make some alluvial fans, if you want to use uh, 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 if you want to use some uh, uh, geology terms or or, uh, or geography terms, a geo term, uh, alluvial fans are sediment that comes out and spreads out after there's been water and floods through mountains that wash out dust and dirt and loose rocks. Uh, so it, uh, an alluvial fan in this case would almost look like a vomit spray of silt and mud and uh, and little pebbles. And we say, all right, so there's at least a steady, and then they guide it underground to the underground city, but there's the at least the overt farming keeping uh keeping things going they must trade through here and so if the water and maybe some of the grain go here then maybe there's something special about these people that make the wine and this is an agreement like a trade agreement that these families bloodlines clans or city states are holding themselves to so that they have relevance and they must cooperate in a harsh desert desert environment Okay. And you say, well, yeah, if I made a water tribe, I'll make a, a vintner tribe or whatever. I'll make a whatever, a, a building supply, uh, a masons or something like that. And now with starting with a little splash of color and one idea of specialization <coughs> and unification through trading you are now able to populate the current day people because we did learn that they live in harmony and that the leader of this confederacy is respected, fair, and just. Well, if they have an underground uh, uh, city covert, there may very well be uh, the covert farming. Uh, maybe they grow, uh, you know, different like um, uh, freshwater cress or mushrooms or uh, you can grow things like uh, corn, not fully, but like corn shoots in dark houses. And it provides a different flavor because the photosynthesis isn't working as it should, but the, the biology, the plant still forces it to grow. And so you get something that's actually sweeter. If you've ever eaten something grown in a dark house, uh, if you haven't, try it. Or at least look into it. So the entire party worries when half dwarf, cleric, cast, dwarven magic missile. So that version of magic missile is way more destructive and there's a chance he might explode. That would cause some uh, situational awareness to be necessitated. Now, would you say this is complete? No, I don't have names for all this, but there's definitely enough here to start to be inspired that we have taken now written notes and we have applied it in a beautiful way uh, that especially if you're a visual learner, where you go, ah, words, words, words. Everything is just a wall of text. And now you can start painting. Now you can start getting into the prompts for whatever summertime events that are going to create a holiday that we're going to specify in our next workshop. 
because all of these are prompts from history, religion, is some sort of natural circumstance. Could be a, a commercial holiday as well. But these are all prompts about a people who used to or might still currently. Dun, dun, dun. Whatever, whatever would happen if, say, elves were driven underground for a long period of time. I have no idea. <coughs> Pardon me. <coughs> I must have a spider caught in my throat. There you go. Marco is paying attention. Because uh, because those sun elves don't photosynthesize, they'll taste sweeter because... <laughs> <clears throat> I don't know. Maybe that's the lore for how the drow come about in your world. Or not. It's your world. Just because you're playing drow mechanically from the player's handbook, or maybe you're not, doesn't mean you have to follow the uh, the old lore or the new lore of the drow. But we've gone through now, and we have so many tools at our disposal that with the the next workshop, not tonight, but with our next workshop time together, uh, we are going to be able to draw eh, all of this together and list out the details of the holiday. What's the holiday about? What do people eat or wear uh, during this holiday time? Is it pumpkin spice season in the cold desert? Could there be pumpkins and spice? Perhaps. I think we've allowed for it to at least be a possibility. Yep, so OMGM, uh, what we've done is in last night's workshop, we made personifications of holidays, or it could be a, a tradition, folklore, mythology, religious story, a, a civic event in history. We made four personifications, two NPCs and two villains, using a methodology found in the Player's Handbook and especially the Dungeon Master's Guide. Tonight, uh, using both those books, we created the region in which these people are going to celebrate a summertime holiday. Now that we've also made a basic flesh out of a map, in the next workshop, we're going to get a list of qualities of the holiday and it's going to come together. And it'll be organic and easy. And when we finish, we're going to have a culturally significant, relevant, and easy to describe, an easy to describe uh, presentation that you can give to your players if you have a place like this in your world. And it, it won't just be you going, ah, all right. It, it, so just go along with me, everyone. It's the 4th of July, but it's not the 4th of July. Wink, wink. You know, it's National Hot Dog Eating Day, but you're not eating hot dogs. Come on now. <laughs> 